Hi, students. So um, I thought I would go ahead and read some of The Great Gatsby to you um, for two reasons. One, this is typically what I do when I'm actually teaching this class is we read a little bit of the chapters together because the chapters are a little bit long. Um, and also so that while we're going through it, I can provide you with like, you can see I have like some explanatory notes, like things you might wanna know that might be helpful to make the chapter um, make a little bit more sense. I'm going to try to post these and read as many chapters as I can. I can't promise you that I'm going to be able to read the whole book to you because just time and all that. Um, but also, I'm going to read it aloud because I know right now it might be like really hard to find the motivation to get yourself organized and to get your work done. And that is definitely something that I think we're all struggling with right now is trying to figure out like what are we doing right now. So I thought I would go ahead and um, just read chapter one to you. Um, you do not have to listen to this if you want to read the chapter on your own. That's fine. Um, this is more either if you don't understand the chapter and you want me to give some explanation with it or if you do not want to read the chapter on your own and you just want to listen to it and read it with me. Um, as if we are in class... I'll go ahead and do 365 Days of Wonder. Today is the 21st, which is unbelievable because um, every day feels like the last day. And on any given day, I have no idea what it is, uh, what day it is. The only thing that is differentiated today from any other day for me is tonight I drove through the drive through at Dairy Queen. And that's pretty much all I did today. So we are just having a great time here quarantined. Um, our quote of the day here is where there is love, there is joy. And that's Mother Teresa. And, you know, there's a lady who went through some hardships. So when we're complaining about what's happening, let's try to keep Mother Teresa in mind. I know I'm, I'm trying to do that too. Um, and obviously any thought or prayer intentions, please keep everybody in your thoughts and prayers as we go through this. All right. So this is my copy of The Great Gatsby. Um, Great Gatsby was written by F. Scott Fitzgerald. One of your assignments this week is going to be to watch this a &E biography video on YouTube of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Super interesting guy. Died when he was fairly young. Um, had, you know, an interesting writing career, but over the course of his life only wrote four and a half books. He died when the last one was unfinished. Um, and The Great Gatsby is definitely like his best known book. Everybody knows The Great Gatsby. Some people consider it to be like the great American novel and so on. So um, I just have a couple notes in the beginning here um, that I'll share with you here. Uh, let's see. There's really not much here you actually need to know. Um, so the book was written in 1925. And on this, this preface is not something you have in your book, so I'm not going to read this to you. Um, you can see the first page of the book, he dedicates the book to his wife, Zelda. They were married at the time. Actually, they were married until she died, but they were like separated by the fact that she was living in a mental institute. Um, so he dedicated this to Zelda. Um, and chapter one, you can see I have my notes here that I'll go through. Um, chapter one is going to begin by introducing us to the narrator, Nick Carraway. So chapter one is actually kind of boring. So we're like in relation to the rest of the book, if you're reading chapter one and you're like, oh my God, this guy is so boring. It's because he kind of is supposed to be. So the narrator's name is Nick Carraway and he really is not like an interesting guy. The reason, um, Chapter one is in the book is to set up the exposition for us um, to help us kind of understand the context and what's going on and to give us Nick as a reliable narrator. So in any story that has a narrator, it's really important to establish whether or not the narrator is a reliable narrator. The narrator is known to be dishonest, is known to be, you know, an alcoholic or something. Those narrators are going to be not as reliable. Nick is considered a really reliable narrator of the story because he says it multiple times throughout the story. He considers his best quality to be the fact that he is like unfailingly honest. Like it's something he really takes pride in. And he says in this first chapter of the book that it's something that has made him the kind of person that other people like come to and they tell him things just because they can sense that he's like a trustworthy person. So we consider Nick to be a reliable narrator. And so he starts out the story by just telling us about this. So I have a couple notes I want to tell you here. Um, so when the story begins, um, our narrator, Nick Carraway, tells us about himself. He is 29 when the story begins. Um, and he tells us that he was born and raised in the Midwest. He never tells us specifically where. But that he was born and raised in the Midwest, just like F. Scott Fitzgerald was. F. Scott Fitzgerald um, was, was raised in the Midwest. Um, 
And he has decided to move out east to an area of New York City to learn what he calls the bond business. He fought in World War I. Um, he comes from a family of old money, and he wants to kind of make it on his own. After the war, he finds himself, like, bored, and he decides he wants to make his own money. And so his parents aren't really sure. They have, like, this old hardware business that brings in some money, and they kind of want him to work in the family business. But he decides to move out east and try to make his own money. So he begins the story by telling us what happens to him um, and how his story really begins the evening that he takes a trip from where he is living um, and goes to visit kind of a distant cousin of his. Uh, her name is Daisy Buchanan and her husband, Tom Buchanan. So we start here. Uh, the time is the summer of 1922, and the story spans roughly like Memorial Day to Labor Day. I'm going to read chapter one to you. This is definitely violating copyright laws, by the way. So if this video gets taken down, just pretend I never did this. So this is Nick talking here. Chapter one. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind. Oops, my book is falling apart. It says something about it, right? Ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in the world, in this world, haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college, I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. At this point, my students always ask me, oh, is Nick Carraway gay? And there is like a whole group of people out there who believe um, that the character Nick Carraway is gay and that there's all this evidence in the story. And I, I have never um, seen that. Maybe he dates a woman and um, in the movie he's shown as sleeping with a woman. Um, so I don't know that I actually uh, believe that. But what he's saying here is that when he was in college, a lot of um, his friends would come to him and uh whether sober or otherwise, would tell him like their secrets because they knew he could be trusted. And he says, people would come to me and tell me like all these boring stories just because they thought I could be trusted. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently, I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing, missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I came to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded. That's my daughter. We're taking care of um, Anna Muss and Phillips' cat. Oh, that's not Anna's cat, though. That's our cat. I'll bring it in. Okay, okay. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and had a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with the privileged glimpses in the human heart. And this is what actually tells us... There's Anna's cat. All right. Thank you. It's this is... Jacko. Yes, his name is actually Nemo. This is yeah. what tells us that the story is actually being told as a flashback. So he says right here that um, when I came back from the East last autumn, which sort of implies that it's like the next year, but in reality, um, the timeline is kind of messed up on this story. And like later on in the story, he sort of implies that it's been more than a year since this whole story happened. Um, and it's interesting because the one of the themes of the book is time. So it's interesting that time is kind of messed up. I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you guys now that I'm thinking about it that has to do with um, the book being written. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. So he's saying here that um, he felt kind of disgusted with everything when he came home after what happened, which is what the story is going to be about. And Gatsby was the only person he didn't feel disgusted with. And he says it's ironic because Gatsby as a man was someone that he really didn't approve of. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability, which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. 
It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. Now Gatsby turned out all right in the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby. What followed us floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. And I was going to go into, um, again, this is Nick talking his family. And again, you might be thinking my students always like get past this section. They're like, oh my God, Nick is so boring. And Nick is kind of boring. He's a boring guy. It's because the story is about Gatsby and Gatsby is really where the interest is. Nick is just the storyteller. My family have been prominent, well-to-do people in this middle Western city for three generations. The Caraways are something of a clan and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Buccleuch. But the actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother who came here in 51. That would be um, 1851 since the story was written in 1925 sent a substitute to the Civil War and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. And in this, he's telling us that he's old money. And this is a big theme um, and distinction that's made in the book is who has old money, which would be like family money that's been in the family for generations, and who has new money, which is money that like a person has made by him or herself. Um, when we talk about old money and new money, we're really talking about people who are like extraordinarily wealthy. We're not talking about people who live in like just kind of nice houses. We're talking about people who are like millionaires. Okay. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him, with special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in father's office. I graduated from New Haven, which is Yale, in 1915, just a quarter of a century after my father, and a little later I participated in that delayed Teutonic migration known as the Great War, and here obviously he's talking about World War I. It was always a dream of F. Scott Fitzgerald's to fight in World War I, but he was never able to fight. Uh, the war ended before, like after he enlisted, but before he could actually be shipped anywhere. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless. Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe, so I decided to go east and learn the bond business. Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I supposed it could support one more single man. All my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me and finally said, why, yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, which again, old money, his father is basically paying for him to, to live there. Oh, dear God. <laughs> And after various delays, I came east permanently, I thought, in the spring of 22. And of course, he's talking about 1922 here. The practical thing was to find rooms in the city, but it was a warm season, and I had just left a country of wide lawns and friendly trees. So when a young man at the office suggested that we take a house together in a commuting town, it sounded like a great idea. He found the house, a weather-beaten cardboard bungalow at 80 a month, but at the last minute, the firm ordered him to Washington, and I went out to the country alone. I had a dog, at least I had him for a few days until he ran away, and an old Dodge, and a Finnish woman who made my bed and cooked breakfast and muttered Finnish wisdom to herself over the electric stove. I was lonely for a day or so until one morning, some man, more recently arrived than I, stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village, he asked helplessly. I told him, and as I walked on, I was lonely no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. And so with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees, just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. There was so much to read, for one thing, and so much fine health to be pulled down out of the young, breath-giving air. I bought a dozen volumes on banking and credit and investment securities, and they stood on my shelf in red and gold like new money from the mint, promising to unfold the shining secrets that only Midas and Morgan and Messinas knew. I had the high intention of reading many other books besides. I was rather literary in college. One year I wrote a series of very solemn and obvious editorials for the Yale News. Now I was going to bring back all such things into my life and become again the most limited of all specialists, the well-rounded man. This isn't just an epigram. Life is much more successfully looked at from a single window, after all. It was a matter of choice that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. Yes. I'm going to show you a map of this. I do not know if this is in your book or not. It depends on what version of the book you have. Um, but you can always Google this. So um, this is where he's talking about living. So he lives somewhere in the Midwest. And then he moves. This is going to be backwards here. So this is Manhattan here. And he moves over to this area here. Um, in the book, he calls these East Egg, which is the old money, and West Egg, which is the new money. But in reality, these are called Great Neck in real life. So you can actually like find these places. And this is called Long Neck or Manhasset Neck. And F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife actually rented a house one summer. Um, I can't remember if it was on this one or this one, but he was familiar with these communities. And even if you look at these today, um, these are some of the most expensive areas in America to live. Okay, thank you.
Go eat your frosted mini wheats. Um, and so Nick is talking about living. He actually lives in West Egg. Uh, even though he's old money, he should be living in old money because he's trying to make like his own living being a bondsman. He's living in West Egg. And he says he rents like a little tiny cottage surrounded by mansions. He actually lives next door to a man named Jay Gatsby. And then his cousin, Daisy, and her husband, Tom, who are very old money, they live here in East Egg. So East Egg is old money and West Egg is new money. I don't really remember where I left off. Okay, it was a matter of chance that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. It was on that slender riotous island, which extends itself to east of New York. He's talking about Long Island. And where there are, among other natural curiosities, two unusual formations of land. 20 miles from the city, a pair of enormous eggs, identical in contour and separated only by a courtesy bay. Not true at all. They are not identical in contour, and they are not the same size, and they look nothing like eggs, but whatever. <laughs> Jut out into the most domesticated body of salt water in the Western Hemisphere, the great wet barnyard of Long Island Sound. They are not perfect ovals, not ovals at all. Like the egg in the Columbus story, they are both crushed flat at the contact end, but their physical resemblance must be a source of perpetual confusion to the gulls that fly overhead. To the wingless and more arresting phenomenon is their dissimilarity in every particular except shape and size. I loved a West Egg, the, well, the less fashionable of the two. Though this is the most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between them. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for twelve or 15000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, with a tower on one side, spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy, and a marble swimming pool, and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion. Or rather, as I didn't know Mr. Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore. But it was a small eyesore, and it had been overlooked, so I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. Across the Courtesy Bay, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glitter along the water, and the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I'd known Tom in college, and just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. Her husband, among various physical accomplishments, had been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven, a national figure in a way, one of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family were enormously wealthy. Even in college, his freedom with money was a matter for reproach, but now he'd left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he'd brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest, and Lake Forest is one of the wealthiest areas in Chicago back then and now. It was hard to realize that a man of my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Why they came east, I don't know, although we find out later in this chapter. It's because Tom had an affair and it blew up in his face so badly they had to literally leave Chicago. They had spent a year in France for no particular reason and then drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. And that's basically code for they don't work. They live off of Tom's family money and Daisy's family money and they don't work. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone, but I didn't believe it. I had no sight into Daisy's heart, but I felt that Tom would drift on forever, seeking a little wistfully for the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. He's kind of poking fun at Tom, right? Saying that Tom's glory days were when he was a football player at Yale and things have kind of gone downhill since then. And so it happened that on a warm, windy evening, I drove over to East Egg to see two old friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected, a cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn started at the beach and ran toward the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials, which tell time, lots of hints to time in this story, and brick walks and burning gardens. Finally, when it reached the house, drifting up the side in bright vines as though from the momentum of its run. The front was broken by a line of French windows, glowing now with reflected gold, lots of color references in this story and wide open to the warm, windy afternoon, and Tom Buchanan in riding clothes was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of 30, with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great peck of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin body. Thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. His speaking voice, a gruff husky tenor, added to the impression of fractiousness he conveyed. There was a touch of paternal contempt in it, even toward people he liked, and there were men at New Haven who had hated his guts. Now, I don't think my opinion on these matters is final, he seemed to say, just because I'm stronger and more of a man than you are. 
Okay, goodbye, please. <laughs> we were in the same senior society, and while we were never intimate, I always had the impression that he approved of me and wanted me to like him with some harsh, defiant wistfulness of his own. We talked for a few minutes on the sunny porch. I've got a nice place here, he said, his eyes flashing about restlessly, kind of full of himself, right? Like, who shows somebody their house? And he's like, isn't it amazing? I'm so amazing. Turning me around by one arm, <clears throat> he moved a broad, flat handle on the front vista, including in its sweep a sunken Italian garden, a half acre of deep, half acre of deep pungent roses, and a snub-nosed motorboat that bumped the tide offshore. It belonged to Domain, the oil man, he turned me around again, politely and abruptly. We'll go inside. We walked through a high hallway into a bright, rosy-colored space, fragilely bound into the house by French windows on either end. The windows were ajar and gleaming white, again, lots of colors, against the fresh grass outside that seemed to grow a little way into the house. A breeze blew through the room, blew curtains in at one end and out the other like pale flags, twisting them up toward the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling, and then rippled over the wine-colored rug, making a shadow on it as wind does in the sea. The only completely stationary object in the room was an enormous couch on which two young women were buoyed up as though as buoyed up as though upon an anchored balloon. They were both in white, and their dresses were rippling and fluttering as if they had just been blown back and after a short flight around the house. I might have stood for a few moments listening to the whip and snap of the curtains and the groan of a picture on the wall. Then there was a boom as Tom Buchanan shut off the shut the rear windows and the wind the caught wind, oh my God, I could never read books on tape. The caught wind died out about the room and the curtains and the rugs and the two young women ballooned slightly to the floor. And we're going to find out this is Tom's wife, Daisy, who, remember, Nick is connected to these people two different ways. One way is he was friends with Tom at Yale when they went to Yale, New Haven together. Um, and then Daisy also happens to be his second cousin. So he knows the Buchanan's two different ways, um, although they weren't dating at the time that Tom and Nick knew each other in college. So this is Daisy and also her best friend, a woman named Jordan Baker, who is younger. The younger of the two was a stranger to me. She was extended full length at her end of the divan, completely emotionless, and with her chin raised a little as if she were balancing something on it, which was quite likely to fall. If she saw me out of the corner of her eye, she gave no hint of it. Indeed, I was almost surprised into murmuring an apology for having disturbed her by coming in. The other girl, Daisy, made an attempt to rise. She leaned slightly forward with a conscientious expression. And then she laughed, an absurd, charming little laugh, and I laughed too and came forward into the room. I'm paralyzed with happiness. She laughed again as if she had said something very witty and held my hand for a moment, looking up into my face, promising that there was no one in the world she had so much wanted to see. That was a way she had. She hinted in a murmur that the surname of the balancing girl was Baker. I've heard it said that Daisy's murmur was only to make people lean toward her, an irrelevant criticism that made it no less charming. At any rate, Mrs. Baker's lips fluttered. She nodded at me almost imperceptibly and then quickly tipped her head back again. The object she was balancing had obviously tottered a little and given her something of a fright. He's kind of making fun of her. He's saying the way she's sitting, she's sitting like with her head up as if she's like balancing something on her chin, like completely ignoring him, which is funny because later on he and Jordan are going to have like a little romance together. Again, a sort of apology arose to my lip. Almost any exhibition of complete self-sufficiency draws a stunned tribute from me. I looked back at my cousin, who began to ask me questions in her low, thrilling voice. It was the kind of voice that the ear follows up and down, as if each speech, speech is an arrangement of notes that will never be played again. Her face was sad and lovely, with bright things in it, bright eyes, and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was an excitement in her voice that men who had cared for her found difficult to forget. A singing compulsion, a whispered, listen, a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering in the next hour. I told her I had stopped off in Chicago, which is where the Buchanans are from, for a day on my way east, and how a dozen people had sent their love through me. Do they miss me? She cried ecstatically. The whole town is desolate. All the cars have the left rear wheel painted black as a morning wreath, and there's a persistent wail all night along the North Shore. He's kidding, obviously. How gorgeous. Let's go back, Tom, tomorrow. Then she added irrelevantly, you ought to see the baby. I'd like to. She's asleep. She's two years old. Haven't you ever seen her? Never. Well, you ought to see her. She's, and this is going to be the first, and like really, I think only... There's only one other reference to their baby um, in the book. I think their daughter is only referenced twice here and then at the very end of the story. So they do have a daughter, but she never makes an appearance. Tom Buchanan, who had been hovering restlessly about the room, stopped and rested his hand on my shoulder. What you doing, Nick? I'm a bond man. Who with? I told him. Never heard of them, he remarked decisively. This annoyed me. You will, I answered shortly. You will if you stay in the East. Oh, I'll stay in the East. Don't you worry, he said, glancing at Daisy. Then back at me as if he were alert for something more. I'd be a goddamn fool to live anywhere else. At this point, Miss Baker said, absolutely, with such suddenness that I started. It was the first word she had uttered since I came into the room. Evidently, it surprised her as much as it did me, for she yawned and with a series of rapid, deft movements stood up into the room. I'm stiff, she complained. I've been lying on that sofa for as long as I can remember. Don't look at me, Daisy retorted. I've been trying to get you to New York all afternoon. 
No thanks, said Miss Baker to the four cocktails just in from the pantry. I'm absolutely in training. Her host looked at her incredulously. You are? He took down his drink as if it were a drop in the bottom of a glass. How you ever get anything done is beyond me. I looked at Miss Baker, wondering what it was she got done. I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small-breasted girl with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her body backwards at the shoulders like a young cadet. Her gray, sun-strained eyes looked back at me with a polite, reciprocal curiosity out of a wan, charming, discontented face. It occurred to me now that I had seen her, or a picture of her, somewhere before. "'You live in West Egg,' she remarked contemptuously. "'I know somebody there. I don't know a single—' "'You must know Gatsby.' "'Gatsby?' demanded Daisy. "'What Gatsby?' Before I could reply that he was my neighbor, dinner was announced. Wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room as though he were moving a checker to another square. As slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy-colored porch, open toward the sunset where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. Why candles, Daisy objected, objected Daisy, frowning. She snapped them out with her fingers. In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in the year. Ugh, a dinner party? Don't you all wish we would just go to a dinner party right now? In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in the year. She looked at us ra all radiantly. Do you always watch for the longest day of the year and then miss it? I always watch for the longest day in the year and then miss it. We had to plan something, yawned Miss Baker, sitting down at the table as if she were getting into bed. All right, said Daisy. What do we plan? She turned to me helplessly. What do people plan? Before I could answer, her eyes fastened with an odd expression on her little finger. Look, she complained. I heard it. We all looked. The knuckle was black and blue. You did it, Tom, she said accusingly. I know you didn't mean to, but you did do it. That's what I get for marrying a brute of a man. A great big hulking physical specimen of a... I hate that word, hulking, objected Tom crossly, even in kidding. Hulking, insisted Daisy. Sometimes she and Miss Baker talked at once, unobtrusively, and with a bantering inconsequence that was never quite chatter. It was as cool as their white dresses and their impersonal eyes and the absence of all desire. They were here, and they accepted Tom and me, making only a polite, pleasant effort to entertain or to be entertained. They knew that presently dinner would be over, and a little later, the evening, too, would be over and casually put away. It was sharply different from the West, where an evening was hurried from face to face toward its close in a continually disappointed anticipation, or else in a sheer nervous dread of the moment itself. And this is a theme that's going to come up in the book as well, is this whole idea of, like, the uh, Midwest versus the East Coast, because all the people who are in the story are from the Midwest. So Nick is from, like, an unspecified area in the Midwest. Um, and Tom is from Chicago. And Daisy and Jordan are both from Louisville. And he says um, at the end of the story that this is actually a story of people from the Midwest who tried to live in the East and people from the Midwest should never try to do that because people from the Midwest should only live in the Midwest. Um, you made me feel uncivilized, Daisy. I confessed on my second glass of corky, but rather impressive, impressive claret. Can't you talk about crops or something? I meant nothing in particular by this remark, but it was taken in an unexpected way. Civilization's going to pieces, broke out Tom violently. I've gotten to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man Goddard? Why, no, I answered, rather surprised by his tone. Well, it's a fine book, and everybody ought to read it. The idea is, if we don't look out, the white race will be will be utterly submerged. It's all scientific stuff. It's been proved. Tom's getting very profound, said Daisy, with an expression of unthoughtful sadness. He reads deep books with long words in them. What was that word, we? Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out, or other races will have control of things. And this is kind of where we get a sense of how we, as a reader, are supposed to feel about Tom Buchanan because he's really being racist here. Um, my students always say that they feel like they're not supposed to like Tom Buchanan. And I would agree that F. Scott Fitzgerald has written Tom Buchanan in a way that we are not supposed to like Tom Buchanan. He's definitely not the hero of the story. Um, I wouldn't say he's the antagonist, but he's, he's creeping up there. We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, winking ferociously toward the fervent sun. You ought to live in California, began Miss Baker, but Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. The idea is that we're Nordics. I am, and you are, and you are, and after an infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight nod, and she winked at me again. We produce all the things that go to make civilization. Oh, uh, science and art and all that, do you see? There was something pathetic in this concentration, as if his complacency, more acute than of old, was not enough to him any more. When almost immediately the telephone rang inside and the butler left the porch, Daisy seized upon the momentary interruption and leaned toward me. I'll tell you a family secret, she whispered enthusiastically. It's about the butler's nose. Do you want to hear about the butler's nose? That's why I came over tonight. Well, he wasn't always a butler. He used to be the silver polisher for some people in New York that had a silver service for 200 people. He had to polish it from morning till night until it finally began to affect his nose. Things went from bad to worse, suggested Miss Baker. Yes, things went from bad to worse until finally he had to give up his position. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. 
and the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. The butler came back and murmured something close to Tom's ear, whereupon Tom frowned, pushed back his chair, and without a word went inside. As if his absence quickened something within her, Daisy leaned forward again, her voice glowing and singing. I love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of a, of a rose, an absolute rose, doesn't he? She turned to Miss Baker for confirmation. An absolute rose? This was untrue. I'm not even faintly like a rose. She was only extemporizing, but a stirring warmth flowed from her as if her heart was trying to come out to you, concealed in one of those breathless, thrilling words. Then suddenly she threw her napkin on the table and excused herself and went into the house. Miss Baker and I exchanged a short glance, consciously devoid of meaning. I was about to speak when she sat up alertly and said, Shh, in a warning voice. A subdued, impassioned murmur was audible in the room beyond, and Miss Baker leaned forward, unashamed, trying to hear. The murmur trembled on the verge of coherence, sank down, mounted excitedly, and then ceased altogether. It's Mr. Gatsby you spoke of as my neighbor, I said. Don't talk. I want to hear about what happens. Is something happening? I inquired innocently. You mean to say you don't know? said Miss Baker, honestly surprised. I thought everybody knew. I don't. Why, she said hesitantly, Tom's got some woman in New York. Got some woman, I repeated blankly. Miss Baker nodded. She might have the decency not to tell a woman at a dinner time, don't you think? And here's where we find out that Tom has been cheating on his wife, Daisy. Almost before I had grasped her meaning, there was the flutter of a dress and the crunch of leather boots, and Tom and Daisy were back at the table. It couldn't be helped, cried Daisy with a tense gaiety. She sat down, glanced searchingly at Miss Baker and me, and continued. I looked outdoors for a minute, and it's very romantic outdoors. There's a bird on the lawn that I think must be a nightingale come over on the Cunard or White Star Line. He's singing away, her voice saying, It's romantic, isn't it, Tom? Very romantic, he said. And then, miserably to me, If it's light enough after dinner, I want to take you down to the stables. The telephone rang inside, startlingly, and as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in fact all subjects, vanished into air. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes at table, I remember the candles being lit again, pointlessly, and I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at everyone and yet to avoid all eyes. I couldn't guess what Daisy and Tom were thinking, but I doubt if, if even Miss Baker, who seemed to have mastered a certain handy skepticism, was able utterly to put this fifth guest's shrill, metallic urgency out of mind. To a certain temperament, the situation might have seemed intriguing. My own instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. The horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. Tom and Miss Baker, with several feet of twilight between them, strolled back into the library as if to a vigil beside a perfectly tangible body. While trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf, I followed Daisy around a chain of connecting verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side on a wicker settee. Daisy took her face in her hands as if feeling its lovely shape, and her eyes moved gradually out into the velvet dusk. I saw that turbulent emotions possessed her, so I asked her, or I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we are cousins, you didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. That's true, she hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything, which kind of tells us a lot about Daisy. She's like, Nick, you and I don't know each other. You we weren't even at my wedding. And he's like, well, I was fighting in the war. And she's like, oh, yeah, okay, back to me. That's true, she hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. I waited, but she didn't say any more. And after a moment, I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh, yes. She looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. I'll show you how I've gotten to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl, and so I turned my head away and wept. All right, I said. I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool. And supposedly, this is actually what happened when Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald's daughter, Scotty, was born. Um, this is apparently what happened when Zelda woke up and found out she had a girl. She said the same thing. The best thing a girl can be in this world is a beautiful little fool. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow, she went on, in a convinced way. Everybody thinks so, the most advanced people, and I know. I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Her eyes flashed around her in a defiant way, rather like Tom's, and she laughed with thrilling scorn. Sophisticated. God, I'm so sophisticated. The instant her voice broke off, ceasing to compel my attention, my belief, I felt the basic insincerity of what she had said. It made me uneasy, as though the whole evening had been a trick of some sort, to exact a contributory, contributary emotion from me. I waited, and sure enough, in a moment, she looked at me with an absolute smirk on her lovely face, as if she had asserted her membership in a rather distinguished secret society to which she and Tom belonged. And I always find this passage interesting because um, Daisy's supposed to be younger than the rest of the characters in the story, and she's only supposed to be about 22. And so it's interesting that she says, I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. 
Inside, the crimson room bloomed with light. Tom and Miss Baker sat at either end of the long couch, and she read aloud to him from the Saturday evening post, the words, murmurous and uninflected, running together in a soothing tune. The lamplight, bright on his boots and dull on the autumn ye leaf yellow of her hair, glinted along the paper as she turned a page with a flutter of slender muscles in her arms. When, she came, when we came in, she held us silent for a moment with a lifted hand. To be continued, she said, tossing the magazine on the table, in our very next issue. Her body asserted itself with a restless movement of her knee, and she stood up. Ten o'clock, she remarked, apparently finding the time on the ceiling. Time for this good girl to go to bed. Jordan's going to play in the tournament tomorrow, explained Daisy, over at Westchester. Oh, you're Jordan Baker. I knew now why her face was familiar. Its pleasing, contemptuous expression had looked out at me from many rotogravure pictures of the sporting life at Asheville and Hot Springs and Palm Beach. I have to sneeze. <coughs> Oh, it's Corona. I'm just kidding. I think it's allergies. I had heard some story of her too, a critical, unpleasant story, but what it was I hadn't forgot or had forgotten long ago. And he's going to come back to this later on. He says that Jordan is a golfer and he remembers hearing a story about her that was not particularly flattering, but he can't remember what. Good night, she said softly. Wake me at eight, won't you? If you'll get up, I will. Good night, Mr. Caraway. See you anon. Of course you will, confirmed Daisy. In fact, I think I'll arrange a marriage. Come over often, Nick, and I'll sort of uh, fling you together. You know, lock you up accidentally in linen closets and push you out to sea in a boat and all that sort of thing. Good night, called Miss Baker from the stairs. I haven't heard a word. She's a nice girl, said Tom after a moment. They oughtn't let her run around the country this way. Who oughtn't to, inquired Daisy coldly. Her family? Her family is one aunt about a thousand years old. Besides, Nick's going to look after her, aren't you, Nick? She's going to spend lots of weekends out here this summer. I think the home influence will be very good for her. Daisy and Tom looked at each other for a moment in silence. Is she from New York? I asked quickly. From Louisville. Our white girlhood was passed together there. Our beautiful white... Did I, you give Nick a little heart-to-heart -heart talk on the veranda, demanded Tom suddenly. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember, but I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up at us. And first thing you know, don't believe everything you hear, Nick, he advised me. I said lightly that I had heard nothing at all. And a few minutes later, I got up to go home. They came to the door with me and stood side by side in a cheerful square of light. As I started my motor, Daisy peremptorily called out, Wait! I forgot to ask you something, and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out west. That's right, corroborated Tom kindly. We heard you were engaged. It's a libel. I'm too poor. But we heard it, insisted Daisy, surprising me by opening up again in a flower-like way. We heard it from three people, so it must be true. Of course, I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged. The fact that gossip had published the bands was one of the reasons I had come east. You can't stop going with an old friend on account of rumors. And on the other hand, I had no intention of being rumored into marriage. Their interest rather touched me and made me less remotely rich made them less remotely rich. Nevertheless, I was confused and a little disgusted as I drove away. It seemed to me that the thing for Daisy to do was rush out of the house, child in arms, but apparently there were no such intentions in her head. As for Tom, the fact that he had some woman in New York was rather less surprising than that he had been depressed by a book. Something was making him nibble at the edge of his stale ideas as if his sturdy physical egotism no longer nourished his peremptory heart. Already it was a deep summer on roadhouse roofs and in front of wayside garages where a new red gas pump set out in pools of light. And when I reached my estate at West Egg, I ran the car under its shed and sat for a while on an abandoned grass roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud bright night with wings beating in the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew the frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wavered across the moonlight and turning my head to watch it, I saw that I was not alone. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion and was standing with his hands in his pockets regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movements and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it was Mr. Gatsby himself, come out to determine what share was his of our local heavens. I decided to call to him. Miss Baker had mentioned him at dinner, and that would do for an introduction. But I didn't call to him, for he gave a sudden intimation that he was content to be along. He stretched out his arms toward the dark water in a curious way. As far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away, that might have been the end of a dock. And I looked once more for Gatsby. He had vanished, and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. So that's the end of Chapter 1, and I will try to get Chapter 2 up for you guys. And as always, email me with any questions. Have a great night.